Hi there, welcome to this in-depth video on IRDS and surfactant. This video will learn you everything you need to know, the diagnosis, the treatment, and all the functions of surfactant in your lungs. This video is mostly meant for medical students or medical professionals and anyone who wants to learn a little bit more. But if you're looking for another video, feel free to check out the ones on my channel and subscribe for more content. Before we start, a little disclaimer, this video is meant purely informational this is not medical advice, and if you're looking for it, always contact your own doctor. So let's get into it. Hyaline membrane disease, or IRDS, idiopathic respiratory distress syndrome, is a disease where there's a lack of surfactant. It can be caused by three uh, causes. First of all, the most common one, prematurely born children with immature lungs, which are not able to make surfactant themselves yet. Then neonatal infections, which destroy the surfactant in the lungs. And lastly, some genetic problems, which uh, cause a problem with the production of surfactant in the lungs. All three lead to no surfactant and make breathing very difficult. And 1% of all neonates is born with any of these conditions, and it's a common cause of death in the infants. Mortality decreases with increasing age, where it's 50% when children are born from 26 to 28 weeks and it's only 25% when children are born 30 to 31 weeks and so on, it decreases. Risk factors are male gender, Caucasian, diabetes mellitus in the mother and prematurely born twins. If we're looking at uh, the lungs itself, it's uh, important to focus at the alveoli which consists mainly at walls and septa where the gas exchange between the outside air and your lungs is done. They consist um, of three types of cells. Type 1 forms 95% of an alveoli, and it's a squamous epithelial cell. They form the thin walls where the gas exchange, the oxygen, and the, um, the oxygen is exchanged again, and these cells are not divisible. Then we have type 2 cells, which form 5% of your alveoli, and they make the epithelial fluid, this is in your uh, alveoli, and they make the surfactant that lowers the surface tension and makes it more easy for you to in and exhale. Those cells are divisible and can differentiate to the type 1 cells. And lastly, we have an alveolar macrophage, which does its part in the immune response. When pathogens enter your alveoli, they clean it up. Then with 24 weeks, your premature lung uh, is done. You have your type 1 and your type 2 cells, but it's not functional yet, uh, yet. From then on, you start making surfactant, and it takes at least 10 more weeks before you have enough to be able to in and exhale properly yourself. The surfactant is stores, stored in the lamellar, lamellar, lamellar bodies and is then given to the airspace in the alveoli itself, where it can reduce the surface tension. This is done by the Laplace law. P stands for the gas pressure, gamma is the surface tension, and R is the radius of your alveoli. And here you see clearly that when you inhale and your alveoli gets bigger, your diameter or your radius gets bigger, the fracture gets smaller, and therefore the pressure in the lung uh, gets lower. And the other way around, it's also true. When you exhale, your radius gets smaller, and therefore the pressure can get bigger. So if you're looking at surfactant, it's made by phospholipids and apoproteins. Those phospholipids are very important because they can, at one end, uh, bind to water and at the other, uh, other, other end, the air. So they are 40% of your surfactant. And this surfactant can have many functions. It enlarges the pulmonary compliance. It has prevention of atelectasis because it increases uh, the surface tension and, and expiration. It's uh, almost impossible to let the alveoli collapse and therefore no atelectasis can occur. It also makes it easier to inhale again after the end expiration. And this is um, the same with a balloon. The balloon is very hard to start blowing up, but if it's already blown up and the surface tension reduces, it's very easy to increase it even further. And this is what surfactant does for your lung. And lastly, um, it works as a congenital defense. The SP uh, proteins, so SPE and SPD, 
they bind sugars to pathogens which are in your alveolar and therefore uh, with this binding the alveolar macrophage can more easily phagocytize them and clean up your alveoli. So if we're looking at the compliance of the lung, it's the ability of your lung uh, or thorax to expand uh, and this is uh, set as volume change per pressure change. And it's important to note that with the same pressure, more volume can be expirated than inspirated, because expiration uh, takes more, uh, takes less effort. And this is due to the water surface pressure being higher than your lung surface pressure. So the water in your lung always makes your lung collapse more. Um, but because we have surfactant, and when your lung is all exhaled and all clumped together uh, all the uh, surfactant is also clumped together lowers the surface pressure and made it zero and then it's easy again to start inhaling as we talked about the balloon getting bigger that's easier so when you inspirate your alveoli get bigger and the surfactant that first was uh, all together now gets more spread and this uh, increases the surface tension and makes it uh, expand less rapidly. So first it's very easy, all the surfactant is close together and then when it's more spread it gets harder and harder for the alveoli to expand. And this makes it uh, that almost alveoli expand jointly together. Because when one goes faster than the other, it, uh, surfactant is more fast spread and it starts expanding less slow and the other ones uh, do exactly the same thing. So when we're looking at the pathophysiology of IRDS and you see that those children have no surfactant and therefore their alveoli collapse. This increases the effort that is necessary to make them open. It's the same as with the balloon, it's very hard to get it starting. And this may lead to hypoxia. The collapsed alveoli may lead to atelectasis and further apoptosis of the alveoli and a fibrin layer starts to form. This makes it again harder for the still functional alveoli because the fibrin keeps them down and then more hypoxia and more effort to breathe uh, occur and it's like a vicious cycle. This can lead to vasoconstriction of your arteria pulmonaris and later to hypertension of your right ventricle and you get two images one at one hand the collapsed alveoli which are not functional anymore they have no surfactant and um, they start getting fibrin layers and on the other end you have the still functional alveoli and they have to work twice as hard so they get hyperinflated to compensate for the non-working alveoli and then the last step, hyaline membranes are formed, which are fibrin, cellular debris, red, red blood cells, neutrophils, macrophages, and they fill up the alveoli and further block the gas exchange in the alveoli, leading to more hypoxia, more uh, carbon dioxide, and an acidose in your blood if you would test it. And this can have several symptoms. Shortly after birth, we see tachypnea, tachycardia, uh, withdrawal subcostally or externally in uh, the child, some uh, grunting breathing and stenosis of the hands or across the mouth. Later symptoms are apnea, lack of breathing and increased uh, carbon dioxide in your blood. And the duration of the symptoms are usually two to three days where the first day symptom gets worse and worse. You need to give them oxygen monitorize their uh, vital signs and check their saturation. The second day they're often way more stable and with adequate support they do quite well and the third day uh, we see improvement of the symptoms and a lot of diuresis so then it goes better again. There can be some complications though, uh, mainly metabolic disorders by the acidose or hypoglycemia, they can have a persistent ductus arteriosus, hypertension, cerebral hemorrhages, hemorrhages or chronic lung damage and um, premature children with also comorbidities by that prematurity have more risk of any of these complications so that's important to note. For the diagnosis of IRDS 
Look always at your clinical presentation, anamnesis, but also physical examination. The second most important is your uh, chest x-ray, where you can see a decreased lung volume, a bell-shaped chest, as it's called, an absent thymus, and infiltrates from a half to one millimeter, and they are called ground glasses. And what you actually see is normally on a chest x-ray, uh, the air in your lungs is black, but now you see more gran uh, granular looking areas, so pepper and salt. Um, it's very grainy, where pepper, so more black areas, stands for aeration, but the white areas stand for collapse and fluid, and it's very uh, visibly seen. You can also check the blood gas, uh, you see a low oxygen and a high carbon dioxide, and lastly you can do an ICG to rule out any heart problems. For the treatment, it consists of three steps. Firstly, prenatal. Um, during the pregnancy, you can give the mother glucocorticoids, which will accelerate the projection of surfactant in the baby. Uh, and an indication for this is uh, younger than 34 weeks. Then natal, when the child is already born, you of course need to give them oxygen and positive pressure ventilation. This is a life-saving procedure, so very important but it also leads to damage in the not so good developed lungs and leads to bronchial pulmonary dysplasia. So that's a bit unfortunate. And then lastly, pulmonary surfactant can be giving, uh, given cis, uh, mostly biological from pigs is what we use in the Netherlands and it uh, decreases the mortality with 30%. So it's a really incredible treatment. And in children older than 27 weeks, this means that the mortality uh, is decreased to under 20 percent so that's really impressive so if you look into the surfactant itself uh, it can be given to newborns with irds as prophylax and premature infants with risk on getting irds or in prophylax of premature infants with a surfactant deficiency for what reason whatsoever it has however side effects it's really effective but it has side effects uncommonly you can see sepsis, intracranial hemorrhages on the pneumothorax, and rarely we see bradycardia, hypertension, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, pulmonary bleedings, and decrease in oxygen saturation. These are serious side effects, but uh, they do not outweigh the potential upside of this treatment. So I hope you learned something. I hope it was clear. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comment section. Subscribe for more content and thank you for watching. See you next time.